So we have Ashley back. So um, my name is Teresa McKay McKee. We'll get started here. I'm the CEO of Nevada Realtors. And I just want to welcome all the uh, property manager members and guests um, to our first of a series of webinars uh, on this eviction issue. We plan on having more if you have questions um, that continue to, to pop up new different things. Um, we don't have dates on that yet, but we'll try to get it out within a 48 hour notice. This one we put together just as fast as we could after we got the um, last set of directives. Um, we got those on, what was it Thursday or Friday last week and have the webinar today. I uh, just wanted to let you all know that Nevada Realtors has been on the front line um, of COVID advocating for all of our members interests. The first initial draft that the governor had, was going to put out on essential businesses didn't include real estate as an essential business. So it is due to um, our advocating efforts and our um, relationships that we do have with people like the governor's office, the attorney general's office, that we're able to allow real estate as um, an essential business. Also, early drafts of Directive 8 prohibited all open houses and all showings. So we were able to uh, change a lot of that so that we were allowed to have um, showings of, uh, of um, tenant occupied, I mean, of owner occupied and vacant homes. And of course there are restrictions to the tenant occupied homes which still exist. We don't wanna get too far into the open house and showing um, issue today. We're gonna focus uh, mainly on the eviction um, process and the, the directives that came out recently. Um, we have created best practices and guides for brokerages reopening and best practices for showings. So you can see that MVR has been very involved on the front lines um, advocating for your interests. In April, we started working on some questions that popped up about evictions. What happens when it's over? What do we do right now? And Chris Bishop, the MVR president, created a presidential advisory group. And those are the members that you see here today. Um, we have six or seven of them. We've invited three of them to participate today. That's Ashley Hawks, uh, Tom Blanchard, and Vonda Nabala. And they'll get better introductions later from Ashley. Um, we also have, uh, as part of that group, uh, the NBR attorneys, Tiffany Banks and Crystal Keegan. They are also on this uh, webinar as well. In their discussions as this PAG, they brought in um, the group of judges, uh, Judge Saragossa and Judge Hashef. Judge Saragossa is from the South and Judge Hashef is from the North to talk about the issues and how the courts were gonna be affected. That over a period of weeks led into bigger issues and bigger conversations, which caused us to reach out to the Attorney General's office, reach out to legal aid, um, reach out to other stakeholders in this issue. Um, and eventually, uh, it, it came to the point that the Attorney General's office through Mark Kruger, who we have on also, that he agreed to be the facilitator and an unbiased party to help resolve some of the issues, some of the differences between what legal aid was advocating for and what the realtors were advocating for and other parties as well. And um, the result of that was largely what was in the governor's directive in, um, that came out last week. So, uh, I know we're all anxious to get to uh, the questions, and but I do want to introduce um, Ashley Hawks. Uh, she has been instrumental in our uh, presidential advisory group. Um, she's going to talk a little bit more about what the PEG went through, um, the forms that they created for you, which you all should have through your local associations now, and then we'll move on to um, more introductions and the questions. So Ashley. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'd like to apologize in advance. Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through. Okay, I just think my okay. Cox has an outage at our office right now in our zip code, so I'm, I'm on my cell phone. So hopefully you can hear. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me here um, to talk a little bit about uh, kind of what we've worked on um, in the, the PAG group to date. I think, you know, we've really tried to work together in an effort to be active um, since the beginning of, of COVID um, with one, the changes, but two, trying to sort of foresee the challenges and, and get ahead of that curve and talking through what those will look like and what um, possible solutions are. So we did come up with a, um, an affidavit, which I don't know if that really will, you know, be as instrumental as we had previously thought now that the eviction timeline has been uh, solidified, you know, to start a little bit later. Um, and that affidavit was more for um, owners under the CARES Act for the government-backed mortgages. 
Um, and then the other was a COVID acknowledgement form, which may be, um, I believe that's with our association right now. Tom, is that, is that active or not quite yet? The, uh, how's my vo volume now? Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Much better. All right. Um, the, uh, the, you're asking about the forms that we the, have, the uh, affidavit and everything. They are on the website, and so is the uh, video that Molly and I did uh, explaining what they are. So they're on okay. the Las Vegas Realtor website, and then they'll be on transaction desk probably in about a week or two, depending on their schedule. Okay, awesome. So those are there. Um, and then I think with that, I think everyone's probably pretty anxious to get to the questions. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, our, our main you know, panelists who will be addressing a majority of these questions. Um, first, we have Judge Hashef from Reno, who is um, the Reno Justice Court, who has practiced law for 28 years and served as a Reno City Councilman for 20 years before his election into the bench in November 2012. Um, we have Mr. Mark Kruger, who serves as the Consumer Counsel and Chief Deputy Attorney General. Prior to this, uh, Mr. Kruger served as an Assistant District Attorney in Lyon County and Carson City. And then we have Ms. Judge Sarah Gosa from Las Vegas Justice Court, who was selected as a Direct Appointee to the United States Air Force Judge Advocate General Corps prior to being appointed by the Clark County Commissioners to fill the vacancy here in Justice Court Department 4. So I know we're all very excited to kind of hear what their take is um, and, and answer some questions regarding the, the future, which is unknown. Um, at this point, I think I would like to go ahead and um, just pose an initial question to the judges and, and just kind of ask um, for maybe you to describe the structure and direction of the body of work thus far and what questions um, have been driving the policy questions, um, and then maybe second, secondly, a summary of the incentives built into the directive for both tenants and owners alike. So I'm not sure who would like to take that one first, but jump on in. Um, I, I can start with that. Um, you'll see, if you read through the directive, it is very statutory, statutorily driven. Um, the discussions that we had were in an effort to be sensitive to the governor's authority in an emergency situation. And he really couldn't re-legislate anything. Um, we wanted to try to stick to the statutory guidelines that are already in place and be mindful that he wanted to open up the gates to evictions in a, in a manner that wouldn't just be like turning on the light switch. So we wanted it to be, he wanted it to be a staggered approach and, um, so that was kind of the, the concept behind the discussions and the, the way the directive came out. Um, it, you'll, I'm sure all of you know that when Directive 008 came out, it was like this huge overarching, no evictions of any kind. Um, and it didn't seem to really uh, maybe have a good understanding of the various types of evictions that are out there. So we kind of wanted to bring that back into this directive. So you've got in what we would call phase one, um, there's commercial evictions that are authorized to proceed as of July 1. There's also some formal unlawful detainer cases. Those are ones that actually get set for a trial. We're not talking summary cases, just the full civil action where someone is seeking possession. Those typically arise in commercial settings, they arise in mobile home park settings, and they arise when there is a dispute. So um, that's kind of the first wave. Second wave is uh, beginning August 1, and that will open up the door to evictions that are cause-based outlined in the statute. So we're talking about holdover tenants, tenants at will, we're talking um, waste, nuisance, violations of the Controlled Substance Act, uh, unlawful businesses being conducted on the property, uh, subletting or assignment that's contrary to the lease, and other lease uh, violations that would be covenants or conditions of the lease to include an addendum to a lease agreement that is a payment plan to take care of arrearages. So all of that 
kind of starts August 1, and then third phase, September 1, would be pay or quit and no cause notices. So that's kind of the basic structure. In terms of the incentives, um, well, like I stated, that there is a, a window opening for landlords who come to payment plan arrangements with their tenants that if their tenant doesn't comply or default in those payments to take care of the arrearages, then that window to use that as a basis for an eviction, as a violation of a lease condition or covenant, that window opens 30 days before a non-payment of rent window opens. So that would open August 1, whereas non-payment of rent would open September 1. So it does give a landlord an encouragement to kind of come to the table with your tenant. Um, obviously for the tenant, uh, you know, they have an encouragement to come to the table as well because they, uh, they don't want to be evicted. They want to try to work things out and stay in the premises if they can. I think that's kind of a general overview. I don't know if Judge Hashif wants to add anything to that. Yeah, just a, just a few things. I agree with Judge Saragoza. I think it's pretty clear in Section 5 and 12 of the directive that uh, if you do come to an agreement with the tenant, and the tenant defaults, and at that point it becomes a four cause termination, which would require a five day and then another five day unlawful detainer. You can proceed after August 1st. Otherwise, if you can't come to an agreement with the tenant, you're just gonna have to wait till September 1st uh, if you wanna proceed with the non-payment case. And as I read it, not only is a non-payment, uh, you can't proceed with a non-payment until September 1st, the same thing applies to a no cause eviction the two that were separated out, uh, whether you filed prior, you have a pending eviction before the court, or you want to file a new eviction uh, before the court. Uh, and then <clears throat> another subset of that is in section five, where they talk about when you must reserve your, um, your notices. Um, <clears throat> so any notice that was basically served prior to March 30th, and the tenant did not file an affidavit, they consider that void. And then if you filed or, or you uh, displaced all summary evictions, you serve that in the window of 330.20 to 625.20, which is, I believe, the effective date of this new directive, and you violated Directive 08, that's also considered void. So you need to be sensitive to the fact that you got to reserve those notices. And again, those apply to the the cases that Judge Saragosa uh, just talked about, which is the lease expires, you have a holdover tenant, you have a tenancy at will, you have a four cause termination or waste and lawful business nuisance, et cetera. And then the directive is very clear that if you proceed on that basis, then you cannot use, proceed when you proceed on August 1st, you cannot use that as a subterfuge for non-payment cases. And in a way they're instructing the courts to, that we have to be kind of the gatekeeper, I guess, and then make a determination that somebody's proceeding along with those cause-based evictions and not using this as a subterfuge or as excuse to try to collect your rent. And then of course, uh, late charges uh, start in September 1st. Uh, you cannot collect late charges from 3.30 to 8.31, 2020. Uh, you can proceed uh, prospectively. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, and then, of course, Section 1 and 3 talks about if this applies to 118A, 118B, which is uh, 118A, Chapter 118A is being the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, 118B is basically the manufactured homes, and then 118C is commercial tenants. It does not apply to hotels, motels, inns, boarding, lodging, et cetera. Uh, so it basically it carves out which chapters are subject to the uh, directive. So that's all I wanted to add just as a footnote to what J Judge Saragosa had just mentioned. Okay, great. I think that that's very helpful. Um, and maybe just continuing on, um, Judge Hashif, I know that you have to leave at 1.30. So um, maybe if you could briefly describe um, what, you, what you feel like you expect to see in the next two or three months. I think a lot of people uh, feel like the courts are going to be overwhelmed with evictions. Um, do, do you and or both of you have any predictions as to what you think you'll see? 
you know, we've had our staff start to track it. I mean, it, it really depends on whether uh, landlords are trying to proceed um, and try to get a payment arrangement uh, with their tenants. Um, if let's say most of those do not work and you cannot come to an agreement with your tenant, then that means starting September 1st, you're gonna have an influx of evictions uh, because that's when the non-payment and no causes uh, kick in. But if, if uh, they're able to come to an agreement with their tenants, um, then we see that kind of splitting. So many of them will get resolved in August. Uh, and then if there's a default, they can proceed sometime before September 1st. But if they can't, there, there's going to be a few that we're going to, we're going to see quite a few. Now, under our system, we cap evictions because we not only have evictions, we have restraining orders, we have a bunch of other civil matters in addition to our criminal calendar, right? So there's just so many we can hear per day. So for example, I have twice, I have a two civil docs instead of one. Most judges here just have the one civil docket. I have two. So I would be doing, I would be doing my civil Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. Uh, no, it's Tuesday, Tuesday morning and Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, and then two, Thursday morning. So I would probably see a, a fair amount of them and I could squeeze more into my calendar, for example. But our court, oh, I'm the only judge that has two civil calendars. So you're gonna be limited with the other judges. Okay. Anything to add to that, Judge Saragossa? Um, yes, I'll add a couple of, of things. Um, one, I, I don't know that anybody really has a crystal ball and can predict the kind of numbers that we'll see, but I've tried to get uh, somewhat of a, a general idea. I know that um, I've heard anecdotally from many of the property managers out there to include the apartment association that they're about running about 85% of their units are paid and then are not in default. So I, I think that a lot of tenants are already trying to keep on top of their payments. That's what I've heard. I also put a feeler out um, within the last couple of days to uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has various area commands that span Clark County and within each one of those is a community oriented policing officer who deals with property managers within that command on a regular basis. So I reached out to them and said, give me an idea from the property managers themselves of all of these various area commands and tell me how many units you manage and how many of those or percent wise are delinquent. And the response I have so far is only 10%. Actually it was 8.3%. 8.03% are delinquent of the numbers reported so far. So I really don't think that the sky is falling. I don't think we're going to be overwhelmed. Um, I think that we'll be able to absorb. It's going to be larger. I don't know um, how much larger. I'm hopeful that these payment plans and arrangements will be uh, made between landlords and tenants where they can um, to limit all of the evictions coming at one time. I mean, typically we're talking numbers spread over a year. And just to give you a general idea of the number of evictions, I've looked at our Supreme Court report from the last fiscal year. There were a total last fiscal year, 45,000 evictions roughly in the state of Nevada. The Las Vegas Justice Court Township handled 32,900 of those alone. So that's where the crux of the the meat is. The next highest court was North Las Vegas Township, and they did 4,000. Henderson did 3,000. Reno did 2,000 last year, and Sparks Justice Court did 1,000 evictions last year. So that gives you kind of a number of where we're really going to, I think, hurt is going to end up being in Las Vegas. Um, we only have, uh, we have two judges that handle civil dockets, but Neither one of those judges currently presides over evictions. We have a hearing master who's going to preside or who does preside over the evictions. And yet another um, wrinkle that all of you really, really need to be uh, aware of is that our chief judge has issued an administrative order um, that has reduced our judicial days from Monday to Friday to Monday to Thursday. 
and that is going to affect the counting of your days or your notices. Um, that was done um, as a result of some fiscal issues within the county and um, some agreements that were come to through SEIU, our uh, union that covers many of our uh, clerks and our employees, and the move of the county and the desire of the county to move to a four-day uh, or a 38-hour work week on four duty days. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm the bearer of bad news. Ashley and, and judges, if I might add, um, there's also apparently going to be two a rental abatement program set up, which may impact those numbers and the number of evictions as well. One of them is being run by Clark County, and that is, um, we have heard that it's $30 million, and another one is being run by the state treasurer, and that's supposed to be $50 million. Awesome. 55-0, Mark? Excuse me? Was that 50 million five zero or 15? 50, five zero. Wow. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Mark. That was actually, you were one step ahead of me there. Um, I think, um, I mean, that's all very, very useful information. Um, at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and address um, some of the questions from the legal information line and um, some of the questions that we're getting. We're getting quite a few right now over the chat function as well. Um, first off, we have a question from Mr. Tom Blanchard, our LVR um, current president and uh, sales director over at Renters Warehouse. Tom, go ahead with your question. Yeah, um, I want to bring this into a little bit more of, a, of, of what's actually happening now kind of thing. We have a lot of properties that had tenants in them that were sold and those sales were stopped or not stopped but sort of stalled because the tenants would not get out of them and the buyers didn't want to, they weren't able to go in and see them. What's the time frame using that scenario where we have a tenant in place um, and let's break it out, they have been paying rent or they haven't been paying rent? Because I have a feeling there's two different pathways. Um, if they have not been paying rent and just been laying, staying in there and the house was sold and we're waiting to have the buyers get in there, when can we file for eviction? Okay. <laughs> We'll start um, there. Well, let's start there. I mean, one, uh, the legislative changes last session made it very clear, although I think there's there was some debate among who you asked in the state of Nevada as to whether or not a lease runs with the land. And that was clarified that it does. It doesn't matter what kind of sale it is. If the seller was a, a landlord and had a tenant in the property, then that lease agreement runs with the land. So the seller needs to essentially, uh, I guess, clean up their house, so to speak, before they sell the property. So either that lease agreement needs to come to a termination by its contractual terms. So whatever those terms are in the lease agreement are gonna dictate when that, when that leasehold terminates. Just because the property gets sold, does not give that new buyer an automatic right to evict. If the lease agreement is still good and still valid, that tenant gets to stay because the lease carries on through the sale. So I, I think the answer to that is a little more complicated because it all depends upon the status of the lease agreement. Okay. So if the lease agreement had ended during this last five months or the, we're three months, where we're into now, right. if it ends, um where are we when are we able to evict okay because now there's so let's just use um a, a, i guess a couple of scenarios some lease agreements by their very terms expire on a specific date and there is no carryover over provision so for example if a seller had a lease agreement that was good from April 1 of 2019 to March 31 of 2020. And that was it, it expired March 31. And they sold the property or are in the process of selling the property with the expectation that the buyer will take it over on April 1 and that their tenant would be gone. And COVID came along and none of that happened and the tenant stayed in the property. Then the tenant is by definition a holdover tenant because that lease agreement terminated. Now, that 
is fluid in a respect of if the landlord continued to take rent from that tenant, they've now created a new tenancy, a month to month tenancy with that tenant. So if the tenant didn't pay anything for April, May, June, July, or up to uh, August 1, then come August 1, that landlord, whether it's the prior seller or the buyer, can proceed under this directive because that falls under paragraph 40.250 as a holdover and they can proceed with a five-day unlawful detainer notice under this directive. If that landlord said, well, if they're going to stay in the property, then they are going to continue to owe me rent and created now a new month-to-month -month tenancy without a contract in place, then they cannot proceed until they can serve a no-cause notice or another cause base comes up. But just their physical presence there and their lack of paying rent, let's say they paid April's rent and then they stopped paying May, June, and July. Well, now they're stuck in a month-to-month -month tenancy with this tenant and they've got to wait until they can either proceed on no-cause or for a 30-day no, I'm sorry, a pay rent or quit or 30-day no-cause and that won't be until September 1. Except for Judge, I would add that that's absolutely correct, except for they can also alternatively enter into the lease addendum promissory note, and then if there's another failure to pay, then they can move forward under that. That is true. And then the one other scenario is, let's say the lease agreement is not so straightforward. It doesn't just have a, an end date. Many of the lease agreements that I see, at least down here in uh, Las Vegas, and I would assume across the state, Instead of saying, oh, the lease is good from April 1 of 2019 and expires March 31 of 2020, it will have a clause at the end of that and says, and we'll continue thereafter on a month-to-month -month basis until one party or the other gives a written notice to terminate. Now, that written notice to terminate is, is not a notice to vacate that you would think of under the statutes. It's a contractual notice. It's distinct. I oftentimes hear property managers confuse the fact that their contract says you have to give the tenant 30 days notice that you're either not going to renew the lease or that you're terminating the lease pursuant to the contract terms and call that a no cause notice. It's not a no cause notice. Those are two completely different things. A no cause notice is used by the statute. It is a notice to vacate and there's no cause based in it. The contractual notice is a notice to terminate the lease agreement that is based in the contractual terms between the landlord and tenant. That type of notice is not covered under Directive 008 or 025. That contractual notice is not interfered with by any of the governor's directives. So if the landlord gets to the point where they say, I want to terminate the tenancy, they can serve that notice. Now, whether or not they can proceed if there's a violation, like if they don't, if they don't vacate or terminate at that point, then they're considered a holdover tenant and you're back to an August 1 start. And, and I would just add to that, Judge, because that's also correct, um, that the notice should be just professional and not contain any um, aggressive language or intimidating uh, coercive language that would put the tenant under some sort of duress like they're being threatened uh, with an eviction. Yeah, and I, and I don't think any of our property managers uh, want to do that anyway, um, Mark. <laughs> we're, I'm sure we all are trying to do well, as professional as we can, uh, even though some of the sellers and landlords may be pulling out their hair wanting to curse every, you know, every way but sideways, but um, we are trying to do our best to make sure that the notice that we provide to those tenants is as professional and uh, as possible. Great. And the only footnote I would add is, if I understood your, your question correctly, if they want to get inside to look at the home, and most leases have a provision that with 24 hours notice, you can go in and, and um, uh, do, do an inspection, et cetera. And, and that is a covenant. So if the tenant is refusing to allow access and the lease provides for it, and there's a statute that's saying the residential side, the, re, the same thing, 24 hours notice, 
then you could probably proceed with a for cause termination if that's what the landlord really wanted to do because they have a contractual right to go in and look at the home. Okay. I think there was a period of time that I thought there was a different governor's directive that prohibited the, the owner from forcing an inspection during COVID. Does anyone know the number of that directive and whether or not that's been lifted? I think it's Directive 017, Judge, um, and I don't think it has been lifted yet, um, but it may have been modified by a right. subsequent directive. I thought it was modified by this um, Not by, by this one. one. I'll jump in. It, it was modified 026, so it was extended. It was extended till July 31st, and so that's the directive. That's a whole other webinar that's on the open house and in-person showings. Okay, great. Okay. Well, I think that that was helpful because a lot of our questions that have come in um, even right now in the chat are regarding holdover tenants. So clarifying that depending upon what lease you're using is uh, certainly helpful. Um, next question we have is from Ms. Vandana Bala, who is the corporate broker and property manager over at Signature Real Estate Group. Uh, go ahead, Vandana, with your question. Hi, all. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, my question, we've talked about the holdover tenant. My question is more about the tenant at will, if you could define that, what that is. Um, but before you get started on that, I know Judge Hash Jeff uh, has to leave, so I wanted to quickly do a follow up if you don't mind. Um, you had said that the uh, payments from March to August 31st, mid March to August 31st, could never there could never be a late fee on those. Um, is that never ever even after they've come into a contract to pay that back and they're late on that contract? I know we sort of talked about that a little bit. Judge Sargos uh, addressed that, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and actually, I don't have to leave because I was just informed that that, my, that trial got continued. Well, fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah, is, is I, and I'll, uh, obviously, Judge Saragosa needs the, to, it's in section, let's see, um, section six of the directive that you can start charging late fees as of September 1st uh, for rent due on September 1st uh, or after. But it says it's not, you cannot uh, collect late fees on any rent that was due for the period 330 through 831 20. Okay. So that, as I understand, is it still stayed. You can't go back in and retroactively apply it. And I don't, and I believe you cannot include it in the repayment plan, uh, promissory note lease addendum either. That's correct. That's correct, Judge. When you come to meeting of the minds and that provision is included in there. Right. Fantastic. So the tenant at will definition, please. So there's no statutory definition in the state of Nevada for a tenant at will. Um, however, a tenant at will in, in case law and kind of common law uh, is a, it's a tenant by virtue of the fact that they were given authority to be present in the premises for an unspecified period of time with an unspecified amount of rent, if any at all. Um, and so it's, it's a tenant that is only there by virtue of the will of the landlord, so to speak. So this scenario comes up frequently in um, I would say you get a parent who allows an adult child to come in and, and stay at home for a few weeks and then they never leave. It's the guest that comes for a short duration of time. They're not expected to pay rent. They don't pay rent. Maybe they pay $100 here or $300 there, but there's no specified agreement that they have to pay rent or any specific amount. Um, it comes up also in cases where you have a a boyfriend girlfriend scenario where you move the boyfriend in or the girlfriend in and everything's great the relationship sours but they were never really paying rent they were there because of the relationship the relationship ended and so really they're the tenant at will because they're not they don't have a lease agreement they weren't there for any specified time they weren't there for any specified rent and that is the nature of the tenant at will mm -hmm. it's not a catch-all it's not a substitute for any other kind of notice it is a very kind of unique situation that, that arises and i would okay. agree with that definition thank you 
Um, next question we have here is, if a tenant refuses to sign a repayment plan promissory note and the lease has expired, can the landlord start summary eviction on August 1st for that? And then on September 1st, pursue non-payment of rent? Or does one have to wait until September 1st? Okay. Can you start the factual scenario over again for me? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's a long one. So if the tenant, re if a tenant refuses to sign a repayment plan or promissory note, right. and the lease has already expired, can the landlord start the summary eviction on August 1st would be the first part. Um, only if the lease is truly expired and the tenant is a holdover. And that was and the so lease, whether the lease is truly expired will be dependent upon the contractual language of the lease agreement and what's been, you know, what's transpired over the last few months. Um, otherwise, if it's for non payment of rent or something else, September 1. I guess the easy, I think what maybe they were meaning is if basically we have to give all tenants until September 1st to enter into that repayment plan before doing anything essentially. Well, you could like, enter a repayment plan now. Sure. But if we enter, if we offer it now and they refuse it, there's still no recourse until we get to that September 1st date. The, not, yes. There's not, not any additional recourse. There's just the recourse that's outlined in the directive. Yes. I think that was the question. Okay. Um, okay. And then a couple of these questions we sort of hit with the holdover definition. So I think we'll go past those. Um, Mark, you briefly touched on the rental relief program. Do you have any other information that you'd like to add to that as far as what types of um, programs or assistance may be available or any other details? Those are the only two that I've heard of. Um, and I believe that you can get more information as it comes available, um, both on the Clark County Social Services website, as well as the Nevada State Treasurer's website. Okay, great. Um, okay, another one here, we'll start taking um, some of the chat ones as well. This question says, I entered into a lease addendum promissory note with my tenant. The tenant did not pay one of the scheduled arrears payments as required by the addendum. What happens next? Could you walk us through that? Okay. Um, the process would be to serve a five day notice to either cure or to vacate, that notice is provided pursuant to NRS 40.2516. There are forms available for that type of um, eviction on the civillawselfhelpcenter.org website, and they can be modified for any township. Uh, that notice essentially would outline what the violation was and it would outline that a payment of such and such was due pursuant to the lease addendum uh, promissory note and that the tenant failed to pay. The tenant has five judicial days to cure that violation. Um, and if the violation is remains uncured, then the landlord may proceed with a summary eviction by use of a five day unlawful detainer notice also available on the civillawselfhelpcenter.org website. And then the five judicial days would count for that. The tenant would have the opportunity with that notice to file any sort of uh, tenant affidavit or answer with the court. And if no answer is filed, the landlord would file their complaint for a summary eviction and the court would review it. Um, if the tenant does file an affidavit or an answer, then the court would set that matter for a hearing and the court would rule on the matter at the time of the hearing. And Judge Saragosa, can I, I'd like to jump in. So something that we've been um, explaining to property managers and landlords is the importance of really keeping the arrearage payment separate than the rent payment. So we discussed in our property management PAG, and I know we've discussed amongst ourselves, um, make sure that it's very clear that rent is due on August 1st, but installment one of arrearage is due on August 10th or August 15th, whatever you come up with. So it's clear if there's a default on that arrearage, not rent. Because again, the rent puts you at September 1st, where a breach of the five day puts you at whenever that happens, whenever they don't make that arrearage. So um, that's something that would be a best practice moving forward. I, I totally agree and echo that. And, and the, 
you know, you may think you've got a, a clever landlord or property manager out there who says, oh, I've got this money came in and my lease agreement says that I can apply it to the oldest amount first. So when the tenant comes in with every intention of paying that arrearage payment of, I don't know, let's say it's $200 or $300, whatever the amount is, and the tenant comes and brings $200 to the table and the landlord takes that $200 and instead of applying it to the uh, arrearage payment, says, oh, well, I'm going to apply it to the oldest amount due first, and that was April's rent. And then they didn't make the arrearage payment, so now you can proceed with your eviction a month early. That's going to be a problem that I think would end up in Mr. Kruger's lap. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. That helps. Um, I think there's, so there's quite a few questions surrounding the forms themselves, so I think we'll jump into those. Um, if there's there's concern that if we use the approved addendum that we can't evict for non-payment of rent after September 1st. Is that correct? That is partially correct. Um, Mark, I, I think you would agree with me that it's partially correct in that if you enter into a payment plan, lease addendum, promissory note for the arrearages, for whatever months those arrearages are for, then you may never proceed on a non-payment of rent for that chunk of money because you're basically taking this big chunk of whatever's due, let's say it's April, May, June, and July's rent, and you're coming up with an amount and you're coming up with a separate payment plan for that amount and you're taking that and moving it over here. It, it's, no, it, it's, it's now subject to its own payment arrangement and you cannot proceed on non-payment rent for that. But you can proceed on a non-payment of rent case for a failure to pay September's rent, October's rent, November's rent, and any other rent in the future that is not covered in this bubble over here that you have a separate payment plan for. Okay, so yeah, maybe I would add the footnote I would add to that is that this new directive indicates that if you do come to a payment plan agreement with the tenant, that if you have a pending eviction case, you're required to dismiss it because you've come okay. to an agreement on the repayment plan. That's interesting. Okay, and perfect. the final piece to that is, is that you can also pursue a remedy of going and having it um, work as a um, promissory note and then go forward in a small claims action for that unpaid amount and then go forward with an eviction for the unpaid amount of the new month rent. Correct. Okay. In fact, the directive addresses that saying you have those two options and you can pursue both. Yeah, either or. And, and, I, and I think that's a, another important um, note to make that entering into the lease addendum promissory note does not modify the term of the lease. So for example, what I mean by that is, let's say you had a lease that was good January 1 of 2020 to December 31 of 2020. And they didn't pay April, May, June, or July's rent and those four months of rent are now part of this uh, lease addendum promissory note. But it's gonna take that tenant nine, maybe even 12 months to pay off those arrearages. Just because the payment plan extends beyond the life of the lease, it does not extend the lease unless the parties agree to it. That's a whole separate issue. So the idea was that it would be an addendum to the lease for the life of the lease, whatever that may be. But once the lease is terminated, the landlord still has the remedy to use that promissory note piece of it to sue or one, to recover portion of it through the security deposit once the lease is terminated. So you might be able to reduce the amount that's due via the security deposit after termination of the lease. But even after that, if there's still money due, you still have the small claims process or civil actions process at your disposal as landlord to recover that money through that process. Okay, so furthering that then, another question was, um, there's actually a couple surrounding your, your view on the benefits of using the addendum versus any um, downsides for using it or any rights that we're giving up on behalf of our landlords for implementing it. Well, pros versus cons. We think that there's only upsides for it. And I, and I did see a question pop up and I, maybe it's a good time to address it is if you have entered into a, a some sort of a repayment agreement 
Those do not carry the same uh, remedies that this one does. However, we've included in there uh, the opportunity to enter into this new, uh, using the form, new lease addendum and promissory note, and that will then uh, be the controlling document and would um, control over any prior agreements, written or oral. Okay. Thanks, Mark. I, I think as to benefits or, uh, you know, to using the form or not using the form or entering agreement and not entering agreement are all case specific. I mean, everybody has a different situation as a landlord and, and as a tenant. And so that, that's kind of a difficult question to answer. The one benefit that I did point out is that, you know, we want to encourage parties on both sides to come together and come to some arrangement if they can. And so if the landlord chooses to use the agreement, they open up the door to that cause-based eviction for non-payment of the pay of the rental arrearage. Um, it's 30 days before it, it, I mean, let's be honest, when all the sausage was grinding, it may not have ended up in the directive exactly the way uh, it started, but that was the idea is that, that it would open up that window 30 days before a non-payment of rent window would open, gives the landlord an extra option. Plus it gives, you know, some, comfort level on both parts that the arrearages are going to be paid. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you could sign or not sign this lease addendum agreement or any other and your tenant not pay and you get your eviction. If you get your eviction, you get possession of the property. You don't get a money judgment. You still have to go through the small claims process. Um, if you work with your tenant to get those payments, you're more likely to get the arrearages paid than if you take a strong, hard position that I'm not gonna enter into this unless they can pay me back in three months, let's say. And the tenant just simply can't afford it, so you never come to an agreement. Well, in that scenario, you're gonna get possession, but you're gonna be out four months of rent. I mean, you can sue small claims, but then you have to go through the entire civil collections process and a writ of execution to collect on it. That's not as simple to collect as it is to get the judgment. And the governor was clear that he wanted to wait 30 days after, within 30 days of his um, eviction moratorium being lifted for you to enter into this, which is why we went through this process of trying to create an addendum that turns into a promissory note that's workable so that people weren't en entering into those things before when you didn't know if the tenant was you know, getting their unemployment. We wanted to give it time to see what's a realistic agreement, a meeting of the minds that the landlord and tenant can come to. So when they go in front of a judge, it's yes, we both agreed to this and there was a breach. So, you know, we're entitled to this. Yeah, and I would agree with that uh, because if you come to an, a payment, payment arrangement with the tenant, then now you have the tenant acknowledging that there's this number outstanding amount, which is a debt. All right, and if there's a default there, you're starting your eviction process somewhere on or about, uh, excuse me, August 1st or thereafter. Otherwise, you have to wait till September 1st. And then if you proceed to small claims court, then it's a civil action and the tenant can then put up defenses as to why he doesn't owe the rent. He'd already paid it, a variety of different defenses. But if you have a promissory note where he acknowledges the debt, then it's a much easier case. Totally agree. Okay. This one's a little bit of a change of gears. This question says, if the tenant is not responding to phone calls, emails, or texts, how do we make sure the home is not being damaged? Lastly, if repairs are needed, how do we get in if the tenant isn't responding to make the repair? Anyone? Well, I think we, we sort of covered that uh, uh, somewhat. I mean, the uh, directive uh, can't go in until, I think somebody mentioned July 31st, I mean, it is a breach of contract, but if the other directive is still in play, you really can't get in there until the date expires. So if you, I think what they're kind of asking is if you have a property that has major repairs needed and the tenant's non-responsive or won't let you in, are we then just to wait or how would we go about ensuring the safety of the property? Well, I, I would recommend two things. Directive 008 is still in play um, with respect to that because 
it's, it allows for, if it's in the contract, if there's a contractual provision that says, yes, I can go in to make repairs, then you still have the ability to do that because all other terms of the contract, which is the lease, apply. Um, I would also um, say that if there is some concern that, that there's, um, that you haven't heard from this person and you're concerned about it, I mean, you can always call local law enforcement to do a welfare check just to ensure that the person is, you know, okay. Okay, great. Uh, another question. One, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, please. The other, I mean, when the governor put out his, his initial directives, he indicated that there were three exceptions. Obviously, the tenant was causing problems for other tenants. It was a safety issue, property damage, or criminal activity. So if, the, if you really believe that there's property damage, then arguably you could probably squeeze within that exception. Okay. Um, we had two questions for squatter situations. Um, can I ask a question just while you're asking that question? Tiffany, you mentioned this, the directive that talked about um, going into the unit. Can you tell me what directive that is again? I want to look at the language of that, so I'm making sure we're giving It was 06, and I think it modified 017. I think 017 is writs of execution. So the original one, I think was zero, was it 008, Teresa? I remember the original one. There's been five uh, modifications since then. So that was the open house and in-person showing. So that directive did not specifically talk about inspections, appraisals. All okay. it talked about, the language was in-person showings of tenant-occupied properties. And okay. so in all of our discussions, um, we just kind of drew this hard line of, you know, the governor's made it very clear that it's shelter, that it's shelter in place, stay at home. And so the tenant has Ooh. the right to that home. And so if landlord needs to get in for an emergency, that's one thing. But if they just need to get in for a routine inspection, and the tenant doesn't want to let them in to stay away from it. So it was not spelled out. It only discussed open houses and in-person showings, but you kind of had to just read between the lines with everything that we've heard um, him say. Okay, that's that was my my thought. And so it, it, I in the in the context of Tom's question earlier, we were talking about sellers and buyers and, and coming to look at the property uh, rather than the landlord coming to want to do an inspection. And there, to my knowledge, there has not been any directive that uh, would cover either a, a, a contractual term that allowed the landlord to come in for inspection purposes or maintenance or emergencies. And then there is also the statute that Judge Hashif uh, just um, made reference to, and that is, um, I'm trying to find it here. So, so Mark, if you were to get a complaint from a tenant saying that the landlord tried to get in for this purpose, how would you at the AG's office handle something like that now? We, we take each complaint on a case-by-case -case basis because it really is factually driven. For example, we got a complaint from a highly sensitive individual. Um, I think there was an elderly person in the home. So obviously um, very concerned about COVID-19. And so uh, the, but the, it was about maybe a routine inspection. And so you can see that one, you can be more like, hey, don't, don't bother these people. Obviously you don't need to. So it's a little bit of common sense when it comes to this. Whereas if a hot water heater, for example, burst, and you know it's necessary for the tenant to have the hot water here um, and, and for the landlord to go in and actually get that repaired, then that becomes, yes, allow it to happen. I mean, use appropriate social distancing and other guidelines, but, but have it um, make occur so that it gets repaired. And, and that's under 118A 330. Okay. So back to the squatter question, is there anything that anyone would like to elaborate on um, as far as how squatters should be handled during this time? I, I think I interrupted you before you even got a chance to ask us the question, but yeah. squatter cases in general are not at all restricted, nor have they been covered under either Directive 008 or 025. If it is truly a squatter, and I mean truly a squatter, um, then those have been proceeding. I've been ruling on those all, all summer. Okay, perfect. Uh, next here. question. Same. Oh, perfect. And then also, they they should not be part of the CARES Act either. Either. 
Okay, great. And Ashley, we're we're coming in on two o'clock, so let's finish up with one more question, and then I'll I'll give people some information on what's next. Um, we have one here. So if if a if a landlord or property manager chooses not to use the re recommended lease addendum and uses their own addendum um, that outlines the payments the payment plan, can they then if a tenant misses a payment, can they then seven day for non payment of rent? No. no, they they would have to adopt the um, proposed agreement that the governor recommended through the directive 025. And that's the um, template that is on the, both on the attorney general's website, but also on the governor's official um, COVID-19 resource website. Okay, perfect. Um, we still, Teresa, I, I can give it back to you. We still have quite a few questions, but if you want to maybe kind of conclude everything and then I don't know if we're scheduling another another call. Right, thank you. Um, all great questions. We're, I'm gonna copy the chat first of all, uh, and we will internally, between our legal information line, we'll follow up. Um, Tiffany has a great, and Chris will have a great relationship with the judges and with the Attorney General's office, and we can uh, make sure that we answer all those questions correctly. I wanna remind people that we have the legal information line, 800-748-6999, and that's open business days, um, every business day. We try to return calls within 24 hours. We have been absolutely swamped the last couple of days, so if you don't get through, uh, just be patient. We do return every call. Um, so please go there with your questions as well. We will issue written frequently asked questions based on today's conversation. Um, and we hope to do another one of these within one or two weeks. We'll kind of see how the questions go. If there's a real need, um, we will ask our, our gracious guests uh, if they're willing to do another one of these with us. Um, we're also available maybe not right away, but to come to individual brokerages, offices, um, local associations for uh, the legal information line attorneys, myself, uh, maybe a couple of members of the PAG to help answer questions as well. So we are trying everything we can to get all of the questions answered. Um, but most of all, I just wanna thank uh, the judges, the attorney general's office um, and the members of the PAG, my attorneys, this, I think was very good, very well received. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time to answer all of the questions, uh, but would anybody like to say a final bit, um, starting with the judges and then going on to um, uh, the Attorney General's office, Mark? Um, I, I guess the one final thing, and, and I kind of want to respond to this question that's on the chat um, about the, and kind of following on on that last comment about the use of the lease addendum promissory note. Um, and this question says, my attorney says it's unconstitutional to require us to use it. No one's requiring anybody to use it. I don't think that's what the governor's directive says. You're not required to enter into a payment plan with your tenant at all at this point. Now, I know that there are um, legal aid has some ideas in terms of um, diversion programs and and they may be going to the legislature in this short session if they're authorized or even later to try to come up with something that would um, at least mandate some sort of attempt at mediation. But you as the landlord aren't required to do anything. You can wait you can just ride it out until September 1st if you want and never even attempt a payment plan under the governor's directive. He doesn't direct anyone to use it. He encourages it to be used. So I just want to make that clear that no one is required to use any sort of payment plan form, the, the recommended one or otherwise. You can ride it out until September 1 if you want to, or you can attempt to evict for one of the cause bases that comes up August 1. Um, or evict for one of the emergency situations outlined in 008 now. The difference is what we can say is that this particular lease addendum promissory note has been kind of vetted through landlords, tenants, uh, property managers, the AG, um, you know, Judge Hashef has looked at it, I've looked at it, and the way that it was constructed was to make sure that there was a remedy available to the landlord that was one, both to get a money judgment for it if it wasn't paid, and two, to allow the landlord to perhaps evict 
earlier than September 1 for a non-payment of an arrearage payment. Now, that's not to say that every other lease addendum promissory note agreement, if you've got an attorney out there who thinks they can do it better, there's nothing that says you can't get a specific remedy if you use a different form, but I don't know what that language looks like. So I couldn't make that advisory opinion in advance, nor could Judge Hashif, nor could the Attorney General's office. I mean, we'd ha you'd have to see it. So I guess I just want there to be a little bit of understanding is that we can only comment on the language that we know, and that's what's in the lease addendum promissory note. If you want to hire counsel and they won't think they can come up with something that would give you some access to the court before September 1, and maybe they can. I just haven't seen that language yet, so I can't say yes or no. The only thing I'd like to add is thank you for, for having us on here and um, I hope we were able to help answer the questions. I, I think both judges here are, are extremely knowledgeable and, and thank you both for answering the bulk of the questions. Since you uh, correctly pointed out, Judge Hashef, I, I think the directive does provide that the courts will be the gatekeeper and make sure that this is done orderly. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is the Attorney General's office is still taking complaints, both from landlords and tenants, um, and we uh, handle those very quickly. So if you need to file a complaint, you can do so online at nv.ag.nv.gov, um, ag.nv.gov. That's all I have. Thank you, and thank you, Mark. Okay, and with that, we'll wrap up. And uh, thank you again. Thank you all. And uh, have a great day and go do business and be productive and uh, keep going. Thank you. 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 Thank you.